Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the city of Salona, where the Quadians are currently making life very difficult for the local inhabitants, and we must make a decision that will affect the rest of our lives. Now, I might be being a little overdramatic here, but we have to decide whether or not we are going to attack the Ostrogoths. I think I said Quadians earlier. That was wrong. They're the Ostrogoths. This is their king, actually. Vithericus. We outnumber them. We are higher quality than they are. I say we do it. Let's stomp them. Come on, Flavius. Let's see what you're about. They are currently allied with the Quadians. Well, gosh, don't want to upset them. And Illyria, which is just one province minor. I'm not too worried about it. All my allies love me. And they practically hate these people anyway. Except for Lazica, who's kind of like, eh. Eh, we're alright with Ostrogoths. You know, whatever. Let's do it. Okay. Ah! I was a little worried there for a minute. Shield crash and your screams on the morning air. Yeah, they really didn't talk like that. They were probably just as educated as anyone else. For God himself. For God himself, because there is nothing God hates more than Ostrogoths. All right, well, Salona is saved, and here we go. I've never fought the Ostrogoths before. Let's fight this one out. That way, I can talk about Julian, the apostate. Oh, by the way, I'm Marcus Aurelius, and this is Total War Attila, the Eastern Roman Empire, and history. Can't believe I forgot that. Not at the top of my game today. So at the end of the last episode, where we left off, Constantius II and his two brothers, Constans and Constantine II, had just gone about and purged pretty much everyone from their entire family, with the exception of their cousins, Gallus and Julian. However, both of them were exiled to Cappadocia in 342, when Julian was roughly the age of 11. Sure, let's start deployment. Cappadocia, if you'll recall, is that region in the, right in the middle of Anatolia, or Asia Minor. Okay, this is an intriguing battlefield. I guess we might as well be near the top of it. Huh. Okay. All right. All right, we're going to do things a little bit differently right now. Since these guys are skirmishers and they can't shoot as far as archers, they are going to be in the front. Followed by our intrepid spearmen. Okay. And then our legio going to be on the flanks. And one in the middle. Our general will be behind them. And our archers will... You will be here. You will be here. And our mercenaries... They can be up at front with the skirmishers. All right, cavalry, let's be heavy on this flank. And you can guard this flank. All right. Well, should I formation all of them? Let's get, let's just leave the cavalry out of the formation. All right, let's do this. So I guess we'll march forward until we run into the enemy. Cavalry scout out.
So when Julian became 18 years old, his exile was lifted, and he was allowed to leave Cappadocia. And one thing worth noting is, when he was young, his parents were both Christian, and he was raised as a Christian. He actually became a lector in the church, which is a minor position in the church hierarchy, and he was very familiar with the Bible. However, he was also raised to understand classical literature and Neoplatonism. The enemy approaches. I see them. Okay, you go on top of this hill. We have the high ground. Okay. We'll get him from this angle, which means that you guys, let's have you go over here, and you, I'm going to have you stay where you are. So Julian studied in Athens in 355, and he was actually initiated in a pagan ritual called the Mysteries of Eleusian, or the Eleusian Mysteries. And it was a long-standing pagan ritual that actually was all the way from the Mycenaean times of ancient Greece. And when I say Mycenaean, I mean like Homer, like the Iliad and the Odyssey. And I guess it was probably at this point where he started really kind of feeling it for paganism as opposed to Christianity. What's interesting about the Eleusinian Mysteries is... There was only one layperson, that is a non-priest, who was able to go into their secret sanctum known as the Anactora, or Anactoron. It was in the Temple of Demeter in Athens. That person, in case you're wondering, was Marcus Aurelius, because he rebuilt the temple after the Scythians burned it down. Okay. I wish I could... Oh, I, I guess I could... Yeah, okay, so I could change my viewpoint a little bit. Alright. Everyone, where are you going exactly again? Yeah, that's fine. Alright, back to regular speed. Okay, the cavalry is charging at our skirmishers, but let's throw spears at them. That's a really good way to take out cavalry, actually. Oh, really? Mounted Warband! Yeah, see, we're already, we scared their cavalry away. That's perfect. Are you all in skirmish mode? No, you're not. But you guys are, though. No, you're not! Ah! Okay. Don't leave the flank unguarded. Alright, they're sending in their spearmen. Where are our cavalry? Have they arrived at their destination? Yes. Alright, here we go. And they're chasing after this guy. Actually, we should probably take him. Let's take him. All right, let's reinforce. You move up. You move up. You move up. I don't think our general has anything to be worried about. All right, cavalry, do what we pay you for. We've run them off. And there's their general. Hit him with spears first. And then send the Legio in. Enemy units have been rallied. Move the cavalry up. Okay. Actually, you spearmen, go down here. You guys join in. 
Why aren't... Why aren't you guys... Go! Who are? One of my spear units. That's okay. Reinforce with the general. Hit him from behind with the spearmen. Get him with these guys. Legio. Come back down. Take out these wavering spearmen. Normally you shouldn't charge spearmen, but when they're kind of disjointed like this. Let's see what's going on over there. Ooh. All right. That looks like a successful maneuver. Take these guys out quickly. Yeah. And that is the end of the Ostrogoths, for the most part. Is there a lot? Here are two of them. Nope. Ten of them. Nope. Nine of them. Seventeen. That's the largest group. Just finish running them down. Twelve. Oh, we're hitting them with javelins. That's wonderful. How many are in the generals? Twenty-eight. All right. Take them down. Sorry, guys. Don't mind us. Oh, we got some friendly fire there. Oh, well. It happens. Five left. All right. Excellent. So much for the Ostrogoths, the Seekers of Glory, and their king, the Therakus. We, for our part, suffered some losses in our spearmen. We didn't lose any unit completely. Let's refresh our losses. All right, and you gained some levels, and you got fear too. See, now that's a much better skill than reconnaissance. God, what a terrible skill that was. Logistician, that's pretty good. Increases food. Lowers recruitment costs. Lowers corruption. This guy does have a fair amount of cavalry, though I'm going to have to get rid of the mercenaries. They're just too expensive. I'd rather have income. Or melee defense. I think what we found is that our spearmen took it pretty hard on the chin there. Let's increase the melee defense. But I think I am going to do higher replenishment instead of the melee defense here. Ooh, ooh, we could add something. Infantry recruits? Nah. 5% armor for commander's unit. Okay. And you are an epic poet. Let's give you this guy instead, because he'll improve your army to some degree. Alright, look at that. Back to Salona with us. Alright, now we have some Quadians to deal with. And we can't just yet. Let's at least assume the position. Can we not? Can't you get closer to him? No, I guess you can't. All right. That's fine. Whatever. All right, so that's the end of that turn. So, basically, between the years 340 and 350 AD, the brothers, the Constantine brothers, the sons of Constantine, fought amongst themselves and amongst usurpers and finally when the smoke cleared at the end of it there was only one left standing and that was Constantius II. However Constantius realized that the Roman Empire was very big and he couldn't rule it all by himself so he promoted his cousin Gallus to Caesar and sent him to the east. This took place in about 353-ish I guess. And what follows at this point is all retold in great detail by Marcellinus in his work. And a lot of it he was there in person to see. So 
Gallus was a tyrant. How would you like your defeat commemorated? An arch or a nice column or by the wailing of your enslaved people? What? Are you high? You are a one province miner in Sicily and you are threatening the Eastern Roman Empire? You're allied with the Alans? Really? No, I'm not going to call my allies. Last thing I need is my allies to send armies to Sicily. Declare all you want. Jackass. So Gallus was a horrible tyrant, and he was loathed by the people of Antioch, where I believe he was based. So finally, Constantius summoned him and had him summarily executed. And that leads us now, two episodes in, to the person we're actually supposed to be talking about, which is Julian. Ooh. Flavius. Oh yeah, this guy. We definitely want to promote him. He's cool. So actually, believe it or not, Constantius II was going to execute Julian II, but his wife, Eusebia, intervened on Julian's behalf. And Julian was actually so relieved and appreciative of this that he actually wrote a work in praise of Eusebia. So Julian was made Caesar in 355, and he was sent to Gaul, where there was some minor raids, and basically he was just sent kind of to be a figurehead. Constantius didn't want anyone to be a threat to him, and he thought that Julian, being this kind of nerdy scholar who spent all of his time in Athens and Constantinople reading books about philosophy and stuff and had a scraggly beard, was uh, not the type of person who could threaten him all that much. All right, let's take on some Quadians. However, Constantius made a big mistake. Julian was an awesome leader, at least according to Marcellinus, who just loved him some Julian. He said so many things about how great Julian was. If you could remember the paragraph I read in the previous episode. In five years... Oof, uh, I don't like the rain, though. In five years, Julian had completed several successful military campaigns against the Germanic peoples, and he usurped the power of the Praetorian Prefect of Gaul and took civil control over many of the cities, which is not a usual thing. All right, you guys back here. You guys back here. I wish I would remember my favorite position instead of making me continually do it every single time. Okay. Yep. Here. 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 Okay. Looking good. Yeah, I wish it could be like save formation group for use in later battles. That would be lovely. Alright. You all are gonna die. Hate to say it, but it's true. So what Julian did is he recognized that the people... Okay, thank you. That the people of Gaul had been raided for many years, there's been civil wars, there was just some unrest, and Julian recognized that they didn't really... that they needed a reminder of why it was a good thing to be ruled by Rome. So he lowered taxes, he heard cases, he was very just and fair, and the people loved him. And it was, again, it was all for the benefit of Rome. It was to make things better for the people because he knew that if things were better for them, that they would be less likely to rebel against the Empire. What a concept, right? According to Marcellinus, Julian was an incredibly just and fair ruler. And after one particularly good military success against the Germanic people, his troops actually acclaimed him Augustus. But out of modesty, he denied this. Or maybe just out of fear for his life at that point, because you don't want to declare yourself Augustus if living is any way in your future. He said, hey, thanks guys, appreciate it. But nah, I'm perfectly happy being just 
junior emperor at this point. Okay. Are we not close enough to fire? Not just yet. Alright. If you guys want to be that way, I'll play that game. Alright, normal the speed. Found our concealed... our troops are being ambushed. No, they're not. Our troops are fine, dude. Alright, cavalry. Go up there. You two. Go up there. Alright, so they have a bunch of brigands and some fundatores. You know, I don't see any reason why we can't just engage. So let's do it. Oh, there come their cavalry. Alright. We're seeing another group up here. They're attacking Allegio. You're welcome to do that. Okay, you guys coming back here. You guys back here. And we're in for it now. This is a really cool map, I think. It's kind of this little valley here. I like it. Okay, we're engaging. How are we doing here? We're beating the cavalry. Not amazingly, but I'll take it. All right. Cavalry, archers, skirmishers, brigands, and you actually help your help your friends on the front lines. Okay, you two, you two. Let's go here and then here. Let's, let's go engage these guys from the side. Okay. Oh, see, they've got some cavalry behind us. But that's okay. We can meet them. Okay, we're engaged with their ranged units. Although not doing as great a job. These are, however, scout equites. I mean, you can't expect miracles out of them. Guys, I need you to be faster than this. Actually, not you guys. Okay. Let's get in their general's face. Where did... Who are you guys? Oh, you're my allies. Hi, allies. Where did their cavalry go, though? The enemy refuses to admit defeat. They, the men have broken and are fleeing. Wow, they actually took out our, our equites. You do not see that every day. All right, go get their general. Archers. Just let's engage those fundatores. Get those or hurlers. They're not fundatores if they're not ours, I guess. General, just get closer so your essence rubs off on these guys. Or oops, spearman here. Take engage, engage. I think we need to aid ourselves at this moment, actually. All right. You guys, brigands. We're rolling up the eastern side pretty well. Excellent. Excellent. I agree. Okay. Come back. Take out their bows. Oops, how do we get in a fight with spearmen? We don't want to leave the fight, though, because then they'll slaughter us. Legio, go. General, move up to where the fighting is. Wow, our archers took it hard. you think this much infantry would be enough, but you would be wrong. Oh yeah, there's still plenty of these guys left. We can't. We can't allow them to escape. Eleven, sure. Did we lose a cavalry unit? Oh, no, you're there. Or no. Oh, whatever. 
All right, speed up. Let's just mop up. And that should be good. You two can get back into formation. All right. I'd say we're doing pretty okay. Although, where's... Okay, you're here. You're there. One, two, three. Where is cavalry? Oh, there it is. Number four. All right. And eye candy. Whoa, fast eye candy. Whoa. Yep. So much for them. All right. So in 360, Constantius sent a messenger up to Julian in Gaul and said that he wanted half of Julian's army that he had been using successfully fighting off barbarians to help fight against the Persians in the east who had just taken over the city of Amida in a very notable siege. And what was really notable about this siege is that Marcellinus was there and he tells it in the first person. And I highly recommend you pick up his work and take a look at it. No, I'm not assassinating Gundevald. Marcellinus suggests that Constantius asked Julian for these troops because Julian was becoming really popular. And Constantius did not like people to threaten him. In that way, he was very similar to his father, Constantine, a real gentleman. Alright, let's finish you guys off. Let's go protective since we have a ranged advantage. Oh, in the face! Sword to the face. Horrible way to go. Make haste, men. Did anything happen to you? We hunger for battle. Nope, you're still good. Excellent. Alright, so the question is, do we move against the Ostrogoths? I just don't think we do. I know we're at war with them, but we can't spread ourselves too thin here. I guess I could move this guy against the Ostrogoths, and I could keep Arcadius at Sirmium. That's certainly a possibility. I thought I was repairing you. Oh, you just you are repaired. You're just not culturally similar to me. I understand. What does Rome require of me? And these mercenary cavalry, despite being very expensive, are actually really helping me out. You're costing 255 a turn, 167, 211. What are you costing? 100. So two, four, so yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's not the reason I've lost all my money, but it's definitely contributing. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, that's all for this episode. But in the next episode, we will conclude our discussion about Julian, the apostate. And we will probably fight some more and increase our economy because it's starting to show signs of wear. So once again, I am Marcus Aurelius. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good one.